Can you hear me? Yeah, you're right. good. Okay. I don't know what went on there, dude.
All right, what is going on, everybody? It is time for another episode of Recovery Revolution Live. I am your host, Brett, and I am super excited for tonight's guest. Um, but before we get into all that, I just want to remind you guys that we do have an audio version of tonight's broadcast. It will be available a few hours after the show airs. And if you're looking for that, you can search Recovery Revolution Live in your favorite podcast player. I also do another weekly podcast called Recovery Survey, and that's available every Wednesday morning. It's a little bit shorter episodes, about 30 minutes, give or take. Um, and I'm super excited about that. This week, I have a, a guest on who's another recovery podcaster, and he shares part of his story. And he also works in a treatment center, so he kind of gives us a look behind the curtain as into what goes on in the recovery centers. And, and it's a really great episode, so I would recommend you guys check both of those out. And without further ado, let me swap to the group view so we can see everybody and introduce Sophia. Welcome to the show. Oh, I should probably unmute you guys. That would probably be helpful. There we go. Now you guys are unmuted. <laughs> now we're cooking with fire. <laughs> awesome. I'm excited to have you on, Sophia. And I'd love uh, if you wouldn't mind just jumping in and maybe tell us a little bit about your recovery and 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 maybe even before that, what your active addiction looked like, what your life looked like, and, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. Um, so thanks, first of all, for having me. And um, it struck me when the countdown was going on, just quickly, you know, seeing all these people in recovery, um, it was actually quite emotional for me because before I got into recovery, you know, I really felt like it was I was the only one and watching that video my god it's such a vast community and, and yeah so it's super special to see that um so i'm sophie um i live in australia at the moment um i grew up in switzerland um until i was about 10 years old in a tiny little village uh, in the middle of nowhere and then moved to the uk um Alcohol sort of became more prevalent in my teens. So as soon as I got to secondary school, um, alcohol was a lot more present. Um, the culture in England is fairly centered around alcohol from my experience. And that, that started quite early on for me. Um, it started sort of at, you know, school discos and, and things like that. And we would, you know, share a, you know, one of those tiny little bottles of uh, spirits between eight of us and, you know, completely be um, out of our tree. But it was always based around um, having fun and being sociable. And that's how alcohol, my relationship with alcohol was um, throughout my teens, really. Um, I also worked in a pub. Um, so alcohol was always around me, um, but it never really went out of control. It was just something that we did all the time, but, you know, it just seemed like fun at the time. Um, I then went to uni and um, things ramped up a little bit, but again, it was always centered around being sociable. So it didn't really seem like a problem at the time. Um, when I finished uni, I actually went back into the restaurant industry and because I just love food, I'm a real foodie and um, I've done a marketing degree. So I really, you know, love sort of promoting food and restaurants and things like that. And that's really where uh, my um, habits with alcohol ramped up. So uh, it was literally on tap and, you know, it became really normal to have a drink um, after uh you know after a shift or just basically um you know to wind down or things like that i mean the 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 shifts were long you know we were doing sort of 80 90 hour weeks so it seemed like the perfect way to wind down um it also became really apparent that it was it was seemingly a really normal thing to do you know people were coming in and they were drinking at lunchtime or they were coming in for drinks in the evening and staying late and things like that so it just really normalized the whole culture of it um it started getting a little bit more serious for me when um the drinking started happening a little bit earlier on throughout the day again it was mainly due to the whole normalization of it all that that really started coming into um, my daily routine and it was just really normal you know if someone said oh do you want to have a drink yet yeah, you know why not but what started happening was the drinking in the evening was getting a lot more excessive. I was actually um, 
having a few blackouts, but you know, it was sort of being laughed off and things like that. So it didn't really, again, seem very serious to me. But what was also happening at the same time was the the drinking was creeping earlier and earlier in the day. So after a long week, you know, we would actually get quite tempted by having a Bloody Mary in the morning or something like that just to kickstart the day. And obviously starting earlier meant that the drinking was happening throughout the day onwards into the evening. So it was becoming a really exhausting way of living, um, but it was actually becoming very normal as well. Um, but it was exhausting to the point of needing to change something. Um, at that point, the drinking didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that the drinking had to change. So I changed my career. So I actually left that industry and I, I focused more on my marketing and I started working um, with some great brands in London. Um, the drinking culture was still very apparent. So that just continuously started to ramp up um, throughout those careers. Um, but it was still always just on the verge of still being acceptable to a degree. So um, it just sort of went on for quite a few years, really, in that same vein. Um, looking back now, it was increasing progressively. But at the time, I was having too much fun to see it too much of a problem. It uh, it did progress, though, and, and really ramped up quite a lot um, to the point of, uh, you know, I was switching up my drinks, so it might have been a couple of spirits, but then predominantly wine, but then it was really getting onto the hard stuff. Um, and also, because people were noticing it more, I was building a lot of shame around my drinking habits. So what began then was actually a new uh, personal culture of drinking in secret. And I would do that a lot on my own. Um, it started off first you know, before I was going out and I'd neck a few drinks to kind of get onto a level I wanted to be on so that people didn't notice how much I was drinking. Um, but actually then it started progressing as, as I started to isolate more, I actually stopped going out and I was just drinking at home um, predominantly. And that's where it then again ramped up. Um, it, I did come to a few points of thinking this is too much and, you know, people close to me were saying, this has got to stop, you know, there's a problem here. And I would stop um, for a month or so and love it. I'd sleep really well, I'd be eating really well, um, I'd be feeling great after the initial few days of, you know, shaking and things like that. But I would then convince myself after these 28 days that I didn't have a problem. So I'd then celebrate and go to the pub and the cycle would just continue again. And that happened quite a few times. Um, I, I actually then went to um, spend some time at my brother's house. He was away. Um, I went over to Switzerland and, and, you know, was looking after the house and things like that. And I went, I had a couple of extreme episodes, you know, quite scary to me um, being alone, but also in terms of the level that I was drinking. Um, it didn't go unnoticed. And when he got home, he noticed how much of the, the alcohol had, be, had been drunk from the house and uh, he actually then came over to England and we spoke about it and I was so emotionally and spiritually and just actually physically exhausted at this point I completely um, you know was open to any ideas that he had and he suggested um, a rehab um, and so I agreed to go to rehab it was um, a rehab in, in Thailand so uh, he actually uh, flew out with me and I was there for five weeks, um, really full on experience, um, you know, a lot of in-depth analysis of how I'd got to where I'd been, and, you know, how I'd got to where I was and what had happened in the past and, you know, how on earth I'd got here, um, as well as a lot of um, other types of therapy and um, physical exercise and things like that. So it was five weeks of um, nourishment really which was super helpful. Um, I left there feeling pretty strong. Um, I'd actually already lined up some travel. I had a, a couple of work commitments but also um, I didn't feel ready to go home. There was a huge um, association with my environment and a lot of shame still around that so I didn't quite feel ready to go home. So I, I uh, went to Indonesia 
to see some friends and then I went to Sumatra and actually on my way back from Sumatra, um, having stepped out of this really cushioned, safe environment that I'd been in at rehab and then stepped out of that, all of my good habits essentially unraveled. Um, and uh, airports had always been one of my my big downfalls. You know, it always felt like one of these places that wasn't really a real world. Um, it sort of was this middle ground where, you know, I could get really drunk uh, without anyone really knowing. So when I actually left Sumatra, I had a huge relapse um, at the airport in Singapore. And I was there for a couple of days um which uh wasn't good um and i ended up getting myself back to bali sort of trying to pull myself out of it but it just wasn't working so i went through quite an extensive relapse there and even though bali ended up being a huge part of my recovery later on at the time it was um such an easy place for me to downward spiral um, you know alcohol was cheap it was sort of okay to do it you know no one was there to check up on me or look after me all that sort of stuff so I was there for a little while until I you know really picked up some courage uh, to go and and go to Australia actually for a short period of time it was about three months in the end and stayed with um, someone that was very close to me who really helped me get back on track and it was three months of real sort of disciplined living um, that was really helpful to me at that time. Um, I then uh, really had, you know, a good run of about seven or eight months. I'd gone back to the UK, I, I got a new job and everything was really good. Um, and then I started just feeling like everything was unraveling again. So, you know, it was again sort of beginnings of, um, the beginnings of a relapse without the drinking it was the sort of spiritual relapse and an emotional relapse um that began before the drinking started again when it did start it came back eightfold um so it was super super intense and it was at that point i realized okay i need to do something about this i haven't done all this work um you know in the background for all this to unravel again um it it also become really apparent that people around me were sort of dropping off and I was becoming really lonely in this process. People were getting quite fed up and, um, you know, through being exasperated really with, you know, continuously trying and, and me not really getting anywhere with it. So I actually booked, um, I did a lot of research and found a recovery coach um, over in Bali and I went there and I finished my job and I dedicated the next six months to really looking after my recovery, which was hard because on the way, um, obviously having to go through an airport, um, it was the kickstart of, you know, another completely chaotic um, scenario. So when I got there, I wasn't in the best frame of mind to do things. Um, anyway, got there, it took a few weeks of, you know, quite an extensive relapse um, for me to then actually look in the mirror I, I really didn't physically recognize myself, you know, big sort of puffy face, super dehydrated, exhausted, um, for me to actually then reach out to someone um, who, thank God, was in Bali, um, a close friend at the time. He came and picked me up and, uh, you know, he, um, he sort of poured me into effectively a safe house, which was, um, you know, a, a small villa on the other side of the island, don't know how we got back there because, you know, I was sort of on the back of the bike, you know, swaying from side to side. Um, anyway, we got back there and, you know, that was the beginning. I met the next day with um, a, a different recovery coach um, down on that side of the island. And uh, it was at breakfast. And I even remember now thinking about it, you know, I couldn't hold anything. I was you know, my spoon was sort of going up to my mouth. I, I really couldn't function. And this guy was just super chilled and, you know, talking to me about, uh, uh, you know, what the next steps might be. I had dipped in and out of 12-step um, before and not ever connected with it. I, I'd found it very difficult in the past. Um, but he, he really encouraged me to go to a, a women's meeting that was on that night. 
So, uh, you know, very apprehensively, I got there. Amazing. You know, there were about 15 to 20 women in there and um, actually met my now business partner there and very dear friend, Kylie. Um, And, you know, that was the real sort of start of the next chapter of all of this. I stayed in Bali for the next um, probably five months. Um, You know, the 12 steps were very much part of that. And there was also another element that started coming out for me that has also brought me through to where I am and will carry me through, um, you know, for many years to come, I'm sure, which was a huge focus on shifting my habits and um, daily routine and things like that. So I actually started off with this, you know, hour by hour timetable that, you know, from 7 a.m., to 8 p.m. was hour by hour, was um, scheduled with different things. It wasn't um, completely filled with action. You know, there were a lot of times just for self-reflection or journaling or things like that. But I was so, my life was so unraveled by then that I just didn't really have any boundaries. I didn't have any sort of sense of um, direction with anything. So it really got to the point of needing that and as time went on as the weeks went on you know that actually started lifting a little bit and I didn't need the hour by hour you know I started doing sort of mornings or afternoons or you know that sort of thing but what it really taught me was how important routine was for me and my recovery and learning the tools to live again in a life without alcohol because Previously, my whole life was so based around it that I couldn't actually function or manage any types of emotions without turning to some sort of alcohol to, you know, get me through it. So it was a whole steep learning curve of getting to know myself, but actually learning how to be a human being, really. Um, So that's, you know, that was the next few months was just purely... um, purely recovery based really. And while I was there, towards the end of my stay there, I met a person who um, was doing these uh, sort of bespoke one-to-one rehab programs for individuals that wanted to come and do it just one-on-one. They didn't want to go to rehab or anything like that. And he asked me if I would um, come and be essentially a, a recovery buddy throughout the day for this client. So I went and did that, and it was such an amazing experience um, being able to be present for someone else going through someone something so difficult themselves and having the compassion from understanding the journey myself was really, really powerful for me, um, and it actually really helped my own recovery as well. So it really touched something um, in my heart, you know, without – sounding too corny about it I really felt like I'd felt a little bit of a um uh, a, a purpose in life you know being able to help others by sharing my journey but not necessarily just sharing the journey and um, just sharing an understanding of what their journey might be like so I did that I went back um to Europe um to see family for a few months and then I was asked to go back um, and work with a client again a few months later and it really just strengthened that feeling inside that it it was something that I really wanted to carry on doing myself so um yeah I just saw a comment service work absolutely yeah it's such a huge factor and you know that's actually what then led me on to wanting to do this as you know, my sort of job, really, um, because it really struck me when I got into recovery, I didn't feel like there was anyone around. Um, And there obviously were, but I felt very alone. And I thought, well, if I can be someone that is available to others throughout their journey, it might just help one other person or two other people or or more. Um, So that was my motivation to do my training, um, really extensive process, um, lots and lots of hours to log, you know, before getting certified and all that sort of stuff. But even that process was amazing for my 
own recovery. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what then um, sparked off the Wolf You Feed, which um, is my coaching practice. And it's, yeah, where I'm at now, it's, uh, it's hugely fulfilling. Um, it's amazing to work with other people, especially in this sphere. Um, and yeah, and it helps me too. So it's kind of this trifold, you know, success really that I've sort of found, which is I'm extremely grateful for. Amazing story. I mean, I, I love I love the wolf you feed. That's what uh, attracted me to, to get you on the show. And you gotta love an Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was wondering, JR, I could read the parable in case um, people aren't familiar with the Wolfie Feed story, if you like. Yeah, please do. I've actually got it here just so I don't get it wrong. Um, so an old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight and it is between two wolves. One is evil, he is anger, envy, sorrow, regret. Greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside of every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. And this, you know, has been something that has been really prevalent in my recovery in terms of really learning how to feed that good wolf, um, but not necessarily cutting out the bad wolf because that's part of all of us. You know, all those things are likely to arise in life at some points, but it's about learning how to manage that wolf and how to hold space for it, but not allow it to take over. And my experience with doing that in my recovery has shown me that, you know, keeping the good wolf at the forefront keeps recovery strong for me. So yeah. that's what I try and help others with in their recovery as well. I love it. I love it. That's, I remember I, I probably wrote it, two or three posts on the two wolves. And that's a big part of it, of my own thing. I mean, because you know, during addiction, we, we have a tendency to feed the dark wolf and that's where our life spirals out of control. But once we get into recovery and we start doing the work to, you know, rebuild ourselves emotionally, physically, spiritually, we start feeding the good wolf. And, you know, it's always a battle inside us, which, which, which way we, we go is, you know, entirely up to us, but we don't see it that way. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people still struggle, but I love what, I love what uh, you were saying about, you know, you, you made it like 28 days and then you're like, Oh yeah, I, I got it beat. I know it all. Let me, uh, let me go reward myself with a drink. And then it, it boom. I mean, yeah. It's uh it's actually amazing how many things I tried to change before I tried to change my alcohol consumption, you know, um, diet, <laughs> um, sleep. I mean, all the things that I do now, you know, that are important to do with recovery, but I was still excessively drinking, you know, so it wasn't, nothing was actually helping or working, you know. Um, so yeah, but though too many of those 28 day cycles happened and, you know, as the saying goes, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And, you know, I was, I was spiritually dead, you know, it, there was nothing left inside. It was just this kind of emptiness that I was topping up with more sort of, you know, stuff to feed the emptiness. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great journey. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing journey and the people along the way, you know, it's just amazing. The it's so interesting how I felt so alone in active addiction, you know, excruciatingly alone. Um, and for some reason, I thought that being in recovery, I'd feel even more alone. 
but actually it's just the complete opposite you know yeah. it's just these vast communities on all these different platforms you know through therapeutic um on therapeutic levels or um you know even social media levels all that sort of stuff it's just incredible it's it's vast yeah that's uh, sort of what i did when i got sober i i was uh pretty much kind of winging it on my own thinking oh yeah i could just do the social media you know you know be brutally honest with with the people that i probably never meet in real life but then it was it i didn't really turn the corner until i got real with the people around me and then my life kind of took off from there yeah yeah and it's that getting real with people around us that's really important isn't it because you know i still through the first three attempts a few attempts i still had so much shame around it that i wasn't being real with the people around me so i was sort of kidding my way and their way into thinking that everything was fine again when actually it just wasn't so when it got to the point where i really realized that it, being real with others was only going to be beneficial even though it was scary and it might have needed a bit more courage um it just worked you know it mm -hmm. really really worked so much better yeah mm. Yeah, and that, but yeah, I was gonna say that, that honesty though can be really difficult to to practice, especially in the beginning, because we've practiced dishonesty for for so many <laughs> years, and then all of a sudden we 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 get into recovery, and now it's like, oh, I'm supposed to be honest about stuff. Like, I I still I I don't know about you guys, but for me, I struggle with that honesty. I struggle with like half truths i want to i want to spin the story a little bit so i still look good or i don't look as bad as as what happened in in the situation and, and kind of try to make myself look a little bit better <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's really natural though isn't it because we have formulated that as our response to everything you know the dishonesty i remember i became you know an expert in um being able to you know, quickly drink something, get rid of the smell, hide the evidence, um, you know, just behind a door to someone else. You know, it was like without any sound or so I thought. It was probably really obvious to some people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's uh, we learn how to be like that. But I think what I found really hard was the deception and the dishonesty went really against my personal values. And that was what was killing me spiritually through the addiction um, you know the secret the secret sort of side of it was actually getting even even worse for me um, and bringing on more shame because I was thinking I'm not this person I'm not dishonest I'm not a liar but here I am lying to my family and lying to my friends you know this is really wrong so as well as not drinking anymore as well as removing the physical addiction and and the, the sort of poisons in my system some of the biggest relief actually came from aligning with my values again you know being the person that i'm proud to be now and actually you know sticking to my word um being truthful with compassion not being blunt and rude and you know <laughs> rude to people but actually aligning to what I stand for um, and yeah it's it's taken a weight off the shoulders because most of the shame around the drinking wasn't the drinking it was it was all of this stuff around it so yeah it just feels like a it was a huge backpack you know just filled mm. with rocks yeah um, it was coming everywhere with me and um, even in the residue of those 28 day you know stop the breaks that I call them, and even actually in the first few months of recovery, um, the rock, the rock rucksack was still there, um, and it was it took a lot of work, like a lot can work to actually go okay, right, focus on this, focus on this, you know, let it take time, but it will take time, but it's worth it, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, I think I got very used to this immediate gratification in life with alcohol. You know, I think as we have in our lives generally, social media, stuff like that, it, it's instant. 
and we tend to um, stay off working on the things that might need a bit of a, a longer haul to get mm -hmm. to the results. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge challenge for me to see the benefit in doing some of this stuff because I just wanted that instant hit of someone saying, it's okay, I forgive you, or it's okay, don't worry about it, or you know, you're already eight steps ahead of where you are because none of that actually came. So it need I needed to trust the process and have the courage to keep persevering even though um, I wasn't getting these immediate reactions from it, just believing that over time it was going to pay off. You know, okay, going to bed thinking, well, nothing's really changed today. Why should I bother? And then thinking, well, actually, you're still sober, so that's a good thing. Just keep going, see what happens, see what happens. And then lo and behold, over time, things start shifting and improving and relationships got stronger and the relationship with myself got better which was obviously the biggest thing because everything else rolls off that um and all of that was just real it was uh, fuel for the fire really in terms of wanting to strengthen recovery rather than fuel on the fire in terms of justifying going back to drinking exactly i think it's uh in, in addiction, it's so easy for us to, to lie to ourselves that so it makes it so much easier to lie to anyone else. I mean, if, we, if I can lie to myself, then I can lie to anyone, you know, and yeah. like what, and I like what you said about uh, in recovery. I mean, we we all want instant gratification. I mean, we want the people closest to us to forgive us, but we've lied to them so long. I mean, yeah, this last time, this is the last time. You know, bond me out, bail me out. You know, they're they are they they are so numb to us saying, "Oh, I'm changing this time. I'm changing," and we want them to believe us, but we have to put the work in to get there. I mean, it takes time for people for these relationships to to, to mend. And when when they start doing that, when you know people say, "Oh yeah, I trust you now. You here here's the key to my house," or or you know or you know just you know believing. It, people believing back in you then that's a big that's a huge difference it's massive and you've just reminded me jr you know it was actually the tiny things at the beginning that meant so much when i realized this trust was coming back you know little things that people saying yeah sure oh can you look after you know little johnny while we go to the cinema or yeah. something you know that wouldn't have happened a few months prior, but it didn't just happen. You know, it was a series of um, events of showing up consistently um, so that people knew they could count on me again because all of that had gone. Um, and it had also gone with myself. I didn't believe I could count on myself anymore. So, you know, that was a huge um, hurdle, a huge mountain to kind of climb as well, you know, trusting myself again that yeah you're right you're making the right decisions now because right. i've been making so many wrong decisions for so <laughs> long i started questioning if my recovery decisions were right or wrong you know so yeah so tell tell us uh actually i want to know two two things what time is it there now and did do you did you ever have any clients that were like uh you know you had to push kicking and screaming to get them uh, to believe, in, you know, in, in your program? Um, so the time here is 20 to 1 uh, p.m., so early early afternoon. Okay. Um, and in terms of your second question, no, not really. Um, generally, when I'm speaking with people, they've got to a point of realizing that this is what they want to work on. Um, so the motivation is already there. You know, um, if I think of the, the, the sort of uh, the addiction cycle, you know, you've got pre-contemplation where uh, someone's not really open to listening to any information. They're just kind of going straight forwards in the height of addiction. You've got um, contemplation where yeah. someone is starting to think about being open to information. Um, you know, then the planning stage where someone's going, okay, I'm ready to make the change, goes into the action chain, the action stage, which is basically where someone is doing the work. 
and then maintenance, which is recovery. Um, if someone doesn't stay in the maintenance stage, they inevitably sort of carry on that cycle and, and go back to the relapse and so on. And generally when people um, get in touch with me, they're in the pre-contemplation and planning stages. So they're really feeling ready for change um, and they've got that sort of, uh, yeah, they've just got the drive to really start focusing on it. And, and the biggest thing, putting in the work, you know, so if I do, uh, if people do contact me and, and they don't sound ready or they're clearly not ready, then generally um, I will, you know, suggest them some things for them to do. But it, it generally means that they're just not quite there yet and they're going to need to either go through a few more relapses or, you know, something until they get to that point. Because I, from my experience in um, when I went into 12 step and things like that, you know, it, it doesn't work unless you want to do it yourself, right? So as hard as that is, you know, wanting to try and help someone, it's just sometimes not possible if they're not ready to do it themselves. I love that you mentioned the uh, the pre-contemplation, contemplation, because that, that's actually in my book. <laughs> Aha, yes, I yeah. love that cycle. Yeah. And people probably wonder where I got it from. I, I got it from one of my uh, uh, CBT classes on addiction. And I was like, man, that's some good stuff right there. Yeah, it's a really interesting cycle, actually, isn't it? Because, you know, just understanding the phases, um, even just for ourselves, if, if we're someone who's, you know, in the midst of addiction right now, just understanding what that cycle can look like and actually seeing that there can be an end to it as well yeah. and can be really motivating for, for people as well. Okay, so uh, take us through your program. Um, so, quick version. Usually, pardon? The, the quick, quick version. version. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there are two um, two programs that I focus on. The first one uh, is the Wolfie Feed, which is one to one coaching that looks like. Um, I mean, it's it's very bespoke to each person, but generally we will look holistically um, at a client's life and work on where their um, blind spots might be, where they want to be going, um, you know, do some goal setting, things like that. And we'll work on a series of six to eight sessions, um, usually one a week, um, where really I'm um, someone who helps them be accountable. So it's very much self-directed in the way of it's what the client wants to do. I'm not shoehorning them into a journey it's very much based around you know where they want to go and where they are at at the moment and all of that sort of stuff um and of course we focus very much on um the wolf so you know keeping that at the back of our minds you know is that feeding the good wolf what can you do you know to keep that going and, and all of that sort of stuff all with the whole goal of strengthening long-term recovery um so i work with clients worldwide um on that program which is really exciting one-to-one -one. and then the other program which is slightly different is um through um my organization called from here on and um, that i run with uh, my business partner kylie and that is given given the pandemic and you know the lockdowns that have been happening um it was a model that was designed to create essentially um at home rehab programs for people um, that you know either can't or don't want to um, go to rehab. And we put together, again, very bespoke, we put together programs um, for an individual, um, and that might include um, Zoom sessions with psychologists or a psychotherapist or a trauma um, specialist, um, fitness, you know, might be a, um, a personal trainer or yoga for the spiritual, you know, all of that sort of stuff, plus our coaching, obviously, as well. And those programs um, are then developed for sort of four weeks onwards um, for people that want to do that from home. Okay. I, lo I love the goal setting part. I mean, so many people just want to stay sober and just, you know, not go to jail or, or and they set, they set their, their limit, their, uh, their targets too low. And I'm like, aim higher. I mean, if you, if you survived addiction, you know, the sky's the limit. I mean, go yeah. for, you know, what, what was your passion? Yeah, exactly. And I also found, um, 
in my recovery, it was also achieving the tiny goals, almost imperceptible goals that were um, really essential for me to keep moving forward. You know, that might have looked like just getting up and having a shower in the morning. That was my goal. <laughs> but I achieved it. And when we achieve something, you know, something happens in our brain and we feel like we've done something and we want to do more. It's just the natural reaction. Um, and so even though, you know, we can start building onto these huge um, goals like running a marathon or, you know, doing something like that, actually, if we go all the way back to early, early recovery, some of those goals can be incredibly effective, even if they're tiny. Making a bed, doing a gratitude list, going to a 12-step meeting, you know, later on in recovery, they might just feel like, day-to-day -day living but at, at the beginning they become goals it's goal setting mm -hmm. um but through the goal setting we then do habit forming so they become habits and then they become lifestyle and then that's when we can start focusing on those bigger goals the marathon the climbing a mountain and so on i love it i love it it's actually um you know with our the way I sometimes visualize it with sort of changing the neuroplasticity in our brains after being in addiction is we're sort of standing in this really dense forest and there aren't any paths to see. And we have to start hacking and creating new pathways through this really dense forest. Mm -hmm. So initially it's really hard to start, you know, pushing through these trees and these branches. But as we keep repeating them, which is where the routine comes in and the habits come in, we start forging um, these new pathways, which are effectively our neuro pathways as well. And then we start thinking differently and start moving in those directions as well. Um, I just saw a comment about someone saying that, you know, they make their bed every morning. And that is, in terms of a miracle morning, um, it's like the, the golden egg of how to start your day. You know, you make your bed, um, this is actually a, one of these big Navy SEALs talks about this. I can't I've, remember. I, I've, I've heard it. I've heard it. Yes. You have yeah. a bad day. At least you come home and your bed's made. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, psychologically, it also goes back to that. You've just ticked something off first thing in the morning. You know, you've achieved something. So it just sets us up to go, okay, great. Well, I'm actually going to fold my towels after this. Or, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to make myself look a little bit you know, more presentable today, or I'm going to make sure I get that task at work done. You know, it just helps us keep getting motivated because if we go back to those um, short wins, the, the instant gratifications, making a bed is a quick, pretty quick one, yeah. you know, to do. So it's also keeping some of those in so that we feel like we're achieving short-term wins as well as having the courage to look further beyond and looking towards the long longer term goals as well exactly yeah. i mean it's like uh what do you say about uh um chasing chase joy instead of happiness because you know the more times you hit joy is you know it's it's like an instant gratification i mean you feel good and and the more you hit it the more ha the happier you will end up being i mean yeah that's uh that's how i view it i mean i had to get out of myself when i was in early recovery I, I mean, one of the things I used to do was when I was in treatment, I, I decided to every, every morning I would say, you know, good morning to so many people, so many strangers. And it would, it, it, it's just radiated because I've been at the, at the same hospital for now for over, over four years now. And it's like, now I know everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's great. It's a great feeling. I mean, those, those little instant uh, little short-term goals turn into long-term goals you know, and, and we're, we're better people because of it. Yeah. 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 And that makes me think of a, of a quote that, uh, I had a guy on my other podcast and, uh, his name's Tony Hoffman and he was in prison and then he's, he went to the Olympics last year, uh, as a coach and he was talking about just like his mindset, mindset, uh, can't talk mindset shift while he was in prison. And I wanted to read this quote because I thought it was just spot on for the topic we're, we're talking about. He said, be careful what you do because your actions become habits. Be careful what you make your habits because your habits become character and your character becomes your destiny. Mm. Love that. Love that. 
Yeah, I thought I thought that was great, and I've I've saved that quote because it's something that's just there's something really powerful about it, and it it reminds me that ultimately the 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 things that I do are going to affect my future, and I have to keep in mind even those little small things can be can be so powerful in my life. Mm. Yeah, I love that, and you know those small things, especially when they're related to kindness. Yeah, you know, kindness is so contagious and it just spreads you know people people need it we all need kindness but we also need to give it because you know other people we never know what someone else is going through um and you know even on my walk this morning there's a guy that i see i walk my dog and he walks you know but we're always a little bit far away but we just have a little, this little wave um kind of habit going on I don't think we've ever actually spoken but we've got this little routine going on and I just love you know those kind of um tiny little interactions that we have with people that take a fraction of a second um Mm. that have or can have a really strong impact both on the other person and ourselves exactly yeah I think a lot of people coming into recovery Think about oh I gotta I gotta do this do this do this they look at the mountain and they're, they're trying to get over it in one jump instead of you know just each day just chipping a little bit here a little bit there you know I mean recovery is a lifelong process you know everyone wants you know we if it all boils back to that instant gratification you know they want to be forgiven they want to be you know and it's uh, I mean, to me, it's it's just lifelong. It's it's a beautiful journey. Mm. I mean, I've lived in Charleston, South Carolina, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I didn't even know how beautiful it was. I mean, till Mm. I started, till I got sober and then started walking, walking more. And I'm like, man, this place is beautiful. I mean, I was walking around, you know, with the little horse, horse blinders on forever, you know, chasing those shiny things that kept me in trouble. It's amazing how um, how much we don't see when we're in addiction, right? In terms of, you know, you just mentioned how beautiful it is where you are. Um, I was the same, you know, I started, I still do it now. I actually, um, you know, dedicate time just to uh, listening to um, the wind in the trees or watching my dog sleep, you know, or listening to his breath, all these tiny things that, are happening throughout the day um, that we just weren't taking on board before. And it, I suppose that comes to, you know, uh, having mindful, you know, practicing mindfulness and things like that. But it really helps with the whole gratitude practice of recovery as well. When we can notice all these tiny little miracles and gifts happening around us all the time. Exactly. So you guys got a big uh, recovery community out there? Yes, it is pretty big. Um, it's um, the AA community seems pretty big. Um, there's there's not a huge amount. No, there's not a huge amount of recovery coaches and stuff out here. I feel like that hasn't quite taken off in in my research and things like that it doesn't seem to have taken off in a, in a huge way yet I think um it's to come because there's a huge addiction crisis over here so there's no lack of people needing it um but um you know I'm I I, I do a little bit of um 12 step but I'm not so ingrained in the recovery community over here i'm still quite connected um to actually the one in bali i don't know if you know that recovery community at all but it's huge huge. you know where barley's at (laughs) yeah it's um it's just massive um which is interesting because it's also an island that's very dangerous in your if you're in active addiction because of some of the things I mentioned earlier you know it's very easy it's cheap it's you know you can sort of disappear into the background but I don't know one person over there um that even has one drink you know everyone's in recovery it's massive you know <laughs> meetings all over the island every day multiples um wow. I love you know, that. Of sort of offshoot communities from that as well you know friendship groups and different kind of 
um, communities and dance classes and singing lessons and all of that kind of stuff. So that's pretty massive and I'm still quite connected to the people there. I'm going to sign, sign, sign Brett and myself up for a dance class. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll bring, I'll, I'll pass out waters. Are you, are you going for like ballet or break dance? What's your... <laughs> break dance. None of, none of the above. Bit of robot. <laughs> uh, don't remind me. I, I have to take a uh, uh, wedding dance lessons here starting soon because, we, you know, uh, my marriage is set for, I think, October 16th. I should know that. You should know that. Hopefully, Carrie doesn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's exciting. Is that is that the extension of this for the wedding dance? Or <laughs> yeah. something different? <laughs> 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 and what's it like? What's the recovery community? I mean... My gauge is that in America it's huge, right? There's a, it's massive over it's, there. Is that right? Well, speaking for Charleston, it, it's huge in Charleston. I mean, uh, our page is pretty much worldwide, but I think most majority is in the U.S. And you know, I, we have uh, some amazing admins from uh, Tennessee, South Carolina, Canada, um, Florida. Uh, we just added another re- podcast. Uh, um, my, our buddy uh, Jeff Vickers, who was actually our first guest on, our, on on the podcast, he's starting one up on Saturday. Ex- excuse, no, what is it? Part of my reach. Part of my reach. Part of my reach. So we're excited about that. I mean, it's it's, it's taken off over here. I mean, there's there's so many recovery podcasts. Mm. See, now yeah. we're international. You're our first international guest. There we go. I'll spread the word in Australia. (laughs) All right. Oh, I know the the guy that just commented. I was talking about him on the last uh, the last live or the one before. He's the one that has the book of uh, of recovery poetry. Okay, let's I thought get him his on name the show. looked familiar. I thought his name looked familiar, and then he just oh, cool. posted the title of his book, and I was like, "Oh, I do know who that is." Jake, come on the show. Yeah, sounds like he, a great book. He went. He went by his uh, his. Uh, what do you call that? The your writing name. Um, I can't think of what it's called. Pen name. Pen. Yeah, he used that on the show, so it's a different name. I didn't. I didn't quite connect it instantly. So, Sophie, would our viewers be able to take your recovery coach training? And how would they get um, in contact you with you off your webpage? Yes. So, uh, thewolfyfeed.com or Instagram, uh, the underscore wolfyfeed. Um, yes, I can put, you know, if anyone's interested in that, please um, ask them to get in touch. Get in touch. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a great place to start learning about recovery for sure even if people don't want to become a recovery coach you know it's really um interesting and nourishing for one's only recover own recovery to actually learn about all these kind of things as well so i was just thinking about um uh jake's message just then about how he was talking about um poetry being an outlet and it's really one of those things that um I advocate strongly in terms of finding something that you love doing. You know, we were talking earlier about finding joy and things like that. If we have something that, you know, like poetry or something like that, that we can use um, in recovery, it just strengthens everything. Again, you know, there's um, there's a way that we can express ourselves and there's a way, again, that we're feeding our good wolf and uh, having a bit of purpose. So, yeah, that just came to mind when that that comment came up. Yeah, Jake says he'd love to be on. Sign him up, Brett. Yeah, I'm down. I'm down. I didn't, I didn't realize my mic was muted there for a second. I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm not used to doing the live stuff, Jr. I'm used to having. I'm used to having that little cushion where I can edit out, edit out my my dumb moments. <laughs> I'm here to challenge you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Make you the number one podcaster on the net. Let's do it. 
Look out, Joe Rogan. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, I believe in multiple pathways myself. I mean, I, I do AA, NA, CA, mindfulness, CBT, SMART. I mean, because if you think about it, our, our addiction is constantly evolving. I mean, if we try to stick to one program, sooner or later, it's going to find a way to, to get into you. So the more you know, the better. Yeah. Like saying GI Joe, what does it say? Uh, what's the GI Joe slogan? Knowing's right. half the battle. <laughs> I have no and idea. it's also, you know, it, it's um, it's so bespoke for everyone, isn't it? Every something different is going to work for each and every person. So right. you know, instead of trying AA and and it not feeling right or another pathway. And then just thinking, well, addictions for me for the rest of my life because that didn't work. You know, it's about really testing the waters with all of these different things because, like you said, JR, you know, there's sometimes we actually can start cherry picking all of the things that work best for us and we make it into our own program. You know, exactly. so um, yeah. there's not one hard and fast way that works for everyone. Okay. I'm I'm curious to know. Someone actually asked uh how much uh Sophie, how long have you been sober? Larry I Birmingham. I started my recovery journey four years ago. Four years, okay. Yeah. I just picked up my four year coin uh Wednesday. Let me let me show you the Phoenix. Can you see that? Oh let me let me let me put you in full. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty special. <laughs> Phoenix Rising. Yeah, we uh, we like the Phoenix around here. And that. Awesome. I gotta ask, what's the uh what's the overdoses like over there? In the US we've had ninety six thousand in the last you know year. Oh, wow. And I think we're leading the, the world right now. Yes. I actually was reading about the U.S. stats recently. Um, the Australian ones aren't as high, but they're rising. So that's where the concern is really, isn't it, I suppose? Um, and the suicide rate is on the rise as well. That those, Both those numbers have been increasing since the beginning COVID. of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Is fentanyl big over there? Not, in, no, not in the same, not that I know of, but definitely not in the same way as in the US. States. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. it's crazy over here. It's in everything. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite frightening, actually. Actually, I've been watching um slightly different drug, but um, Dope Sick, I just started watching yeah. that. Have you seen it, Brett? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Have you seen it, JR? No, no. It's a it's a series based around OxyContin. OxyContin. Yeah. So yeah, all about how you know it was brought on with this promise that it was less than one percent addictive and all of this kind of stuff. And oh. it just goes through the progression of this huge court case around. Yeah, the my uh, my buddy Ryan Hampton just uh, put out his book Unsettled. He was on the uh, he was actually on the. Uh, team that was there uh, on the uh, litigation team. Uh, not he was. He's not a lawyer, but he was there to uh, um, watch over it. And he got he he was so sickened by what they were doing by letting uh, the uh, Sacklers off the the hook. I mean, it's it's insane. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Crazy stuff. The um, ice is is pretty big over here. Ice, yeah. Yeah, that's an, that's one of the Australian drugs of choice over here. Um, but yeah, alcohol. I think alcohol, cocaine, and ice are the biggest ones in Australia at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you know, huge changes and surges through COVID. I mean, from what I was reading last week about america there seems to have been some massive surges over there as well right with them um, with lockdowns and uh, all of that sort of stuff yeah i know thank god for zoom 
I mean, I don't think people in recovery would have made it if, if they didn't have Zoom. Isn't it amazing how you can join a meeting? Like I've been to meetings in Hollywood, um, you know, out back somewhere, Australia, um, cities in Zurich. Like you can really completely, you know, just go traveling through yeah. a, uh, Zoom meetings. And yeah, it's amazing. And thank yeah, you I wait, uh, I, I've been reading up on this metaverse for the last couple of weeks. And, I, and I'm thinking, man, I can't wait till they, they do uh, recovery meetings inside Metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be it's the first ones. Only a matter of time. <laughs> only matter of time. Only matter of time, exactly. We're all going to be wearing these VR headsets, not leaving our houses. I mean, we're going to be inside the internet. Yeah, yeah pretty, pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, saying that, like, how cool is it that we're talking from, you know, completely different parts of the world now at completely different times of the day about recovery? Um, and, yeah, I think it's awesome. Thank God. Yeah. It's kind of one of the silver linings of, locked, you know, the pandemic. Obviously, there's not a huge silver lining to all of the stuff that's been happening. But this connection, this kind of borderless connection that we've, started building is exactly pretty amazing yeah i mean it's pretty amazing you're in australia i'm in south carolina brett's in texas yeah it's mm -hmm. cool where's everybody in the audience from oh that's a good question i know where jake's from because he's uh he's not too far from me we're both in the dallas area Chrissy Morris, where are you from? Oh, that's Larry. Cool. That's Burnham. my wife. <laughs> Larry sounds that name sounds like I bet he's from the UK. Omaha, oh, Nebraska. Nebraska. Oh. Bronx, New York. I guess that's probably that, that's gotta be Jeff. It's gotta be using the recovery revolution page. Okay. Canada. Yeah, see, we're we're everywhere. Cool. I love I love that people are starting to recover out loud. Boogie down Bronx. East Tremont. <laughs> cool, man. You want to do the uh t-shirt giveaway or we want to wait a few yeah. minutes? Yeah, we also we also have uh Jeff also offered to do a giveaway for a digital copy of his book Sober Slogans. Okay. Um so I guess we could go ahead. Uh, well, let's do one at a time. Let's not get too confusing. Yeah, I would do the T-shirt <laughs> now, and then then we could do the hashtag sober slogans. Oh yeah, we could do it that way. I like that. Instead of picking a number, we could do we could do the the same drawing thing. All right, let me do the screen share. I'm still kind of new at this, so bear with me. Share. All right. Here we go. J.L. Weaver, J.L. Weaver. <laughs> well, you commented it in the comments, so it entered us in the. All right, Jake Carey. He, he's the your... author. He's the the author of the poetry book. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I recognize the name now. Yeah. Yeah. Drop us a uh, email the page with your address and your shirt size. Uh, I mean, the biggest we got is extra large, so I hope that fits. I think we have what extra large, large, uh, one medium and some smalls. Nice. All right. Let me let me set up for uh, Jeff's giveaway. Give me one second, and we're gonna use hashtag sober slogans. All right. Now uh, we are collecting the comments. So. Use hashtag sober slogans, all one word, to enter for your chance to win a digital copy of Jeff's book, Sober Slogans. I'll go ahead and put that on the screen as well. And please leave a review. I know Jeff will like that comment. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. 
Nope. Roberto Sober Slogans. Roberto, you should get your copy of my book Wednesday. I feel like we need we need some kind of music or something. I know. We're like doing the giveaway theme song. Do, 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 do. Um, I, I I got a little bit of music, but I don't know if it's I don't know if it's any good for for this. Can you guys hear that, or am I the only one hearing in the music? Can hear it. Okay, cool. I haven't I haven't ever done the music on the live show, so I didn't know if it was uh... pushing boundaries. Yeah, we're doing it live. We're gonna figure this out. <laughs> All right, we got two entries so far for the sober slogans giveaway. So let's get some more people in there, guys. Use hashtag sober slogans all one word in the comments for your chance to win a digital copy of jeff vickers book sober slogans so sophie the majority of your clients are in australia actually um america and switzerland really yeah yeah so it a little bit like today they're just double checking the time zone i'm always just double checking okay uh Seattle is this, New York yeah. is this. Oh no, hang on, we've had a clock change, so it's now this. And then, oh wait, you guys have had a clock change, it's now this. <laughs> but um, it works really well. You know, it's all, well, it's all on Zoom. So, um, you know, it doesn't really matter where, where people are. Stockholm, yeah, all around. Oh wow, that's, that's, that's impressive. Very cool. All right, we're still at two entries. I guess nobody, nobody's wanting to get that book of Jeff's. Come on, guys. So hashtag sober slogans in the comments to get your digital copy. Where's the music, man? You, I can't, you I can't bring it. Well, you start, you start talking, so I, I faded it out. <laughs> I brought the music back. So how can we help you grow your business? Ah, good question and lovely question. Um, yeah, I just I just want as many people as possible to know about the Wolfie feed and what is available to them, you know? So um yeah i'm just happy to do things like i'm really appreciative of this call you know hoping that people um check out the wolfie feed and and see if it might help them and that sort of stuff so yeah i mean i do i do love that name i mean i love it too and you know what it's actually also inspired by i'll just show you this little fella <laughs> oh wow look at it <laughs> jeff didn't jeff just get a dog like that i can't remember what kind of dog you got but see He's that's the kind of, that's the kind of dog again? you need that's the kind of dog you need jr because i haven't heard that dog at all in this entire interview and your dog was like squeaking <laughs> toys and running around <laughs> Well, it's taken, he's 15 now, so it's taken, you know, 14 years for him to wind down. <laughs> yeah, Jeff says he got a little wolf too. Oh, cute. Siberian Husky. Nice, Jeff. So, yeah, JR, anything, anything it, that is helpful, I am appreciative of, you know. Um, yeah, and I'm glad you love the name. Good. I mean, we're here to help promote recovery. I mean, I would love to do it globally. So I'm kind of glad that you you are our first international guest. Mm. I mean, I've been after Brett for a few weeks. I said, we got to go international. We got to go international. Yeah. Brett well, was like, no, know. no, no. Let's, let's stay in the U.S. 
<laughs> well, let me know um, if there's anything I can do to help you guys get international. You know, if I'm here in Australia and if there's anything that I can do from here. I mean, to me, it's all about building contacts. I mean, yeah. I mean, we, we just keep growing your influence. Mm. I mean, if we can, if there's any way we can help you out, just, uh, you know, hit me up or hit Brad up. And, you know, if you want to, you know, post up to the page, that's fine, too. Thank you. Really I mean, appreciate we have, a, we have a, a, a decent size audience. Mm. Well, congratulations, yeah, yeah. Sean. 63, 63 days today. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, the, th the 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 time zones throw me off so much. I I I guess I did the math wrong because I was driving home from work and I was like, I think this is gonna start at one a.m. Sophie's time. Is like that's crazy that she agreed to do this. And then you got on, and you're like, no, it's one in the afternoon. So I don't know where I went wrong with my math, but I was totally off. Well, I tell you what was really super helpful was your message saying. We will see you in 11.5 hours. <laughs> Which is like, there was no room for error then. I was like, okay, 11.5, yeah, cool. You know, instead of me getting confused at the time. So I appreciated that. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I was talking, we were talking to uh, another group in Australia, and I, she might have had the time screwed up too because she's she like, no, I can't do it at, at, at eight o'clock eastern because it'll be like four in the morning here or something like that i'm like man yes yeah, so i don't know what we're going i'm gonna have knows. to go check that uh a conversation yeah i think the, there's only one one hour difference between a couple of places in australia so you know it's not like one's 4 a.m and another one's 11 a.m or something like that we're only an hour or so different between a couple so, hey, I got to know, I got to know this. Are, are the sharks really bad out there? Because they paint a, a bad picture of Australia <laughs> over here. I'm like, there's, there's like great white sharks everywhere. Well, actually, um, there is a bigger picture painted of them than, you know, is actually true. You know, they're not sort of um, chomping people for breakfast from all the peak hours of every beach you know or all that kind of thing however um a couple of weeks ago a guy was uh it was in western australia uh, i think it was western australia was swimming 50 meters from the beach you know fairly shallow waters and was taken you know has not been found again after being oh yeah so there are some pretty fierce ones out there. Um, but there, there are some, they've got a lot of um, security in place. Like there are a lot of nets, say 100 or, you know, 100 or 200 meters out. Nets to sort of stop sharks coming in too close to some of the bigger, you know, more popular beaches. So yeah, but every so often, you know, you might be on a beach and then they say, oh, everyone in. <laughs> Just because I had a need to put those nets out there probably would keep me within uh, knee-deep water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, everyone still, um, everyone still surfs. And I think there's a, there's a kind of thing around people just saying, you know what, well, I just want to live my life. You know, I can't live in this fear of it yeah. possibly happening. So there's still a lot of surfers that go out. Um, but, yeah, occasionally there's a bite. But it's not like you know they're sort of circling the bay. Yeah, as well. they're just waiting for her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cross that line in your mind, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and it's the same with um, spiders. You know, they're not sort of waiting uh, in the corner of your room that I've experienced anyway, waiting to kill you in your sleep. Um, it's funny. It's funny that you said that. I'm, I had a uh, a black widow bite me right in the back. And it's going on four weeks now, and I've been to the ER twice. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Do you have so you have black widows in America? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I didn't know that. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it, it got me in the perfect spot because it's like, oh, it felt like someone jabbed me with an ice pick in the back. I'm like, man, that thing. I thought it was a mosquito bite. 
I'm like, man, that mosquito got me. I was like, like, come on inside, Max. So we're going inside. These mosquitoes are hell today. I look and I, and I ha- happen to look in the in the the mirror and I'm looking at that's no mosquito bite. That thing was huge. Oh wow! And is it does it happen quite suddenly? Did you have to rush to the emergency after that quite quickly? Or no, I looked. I was uh, WebMD in it. My symptoms and they were like, oh no, spider bite usually lasts about two weeks. And I was like, man. I said, I made it like seven days in. And I was like, I got to go to ER. This thing is getting worse. So I went to the ER. They gave me some antibiotics and some ointments. And I went through that cycle. And then it kind of went away a little bit. And then all of a sudden, it came back stronger. I'm like, man. So I went back to the ER. So now I'm on a different set of meds now. Wow. Scary. I haven't yeah. seen one over here yet. Although when I first moved over here, like, I didn't really know any of the dangerous stuff. So I'd go to work and I'd say, oh, yeah, I saw one of these. Um, I saw a really cute snake on my walk. It was like a really cool color with these white bands around it. And they'd all be looking at me going, that's the second most deadliest snake in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be thinking, oh, Echo, my dog was just giving him a sniff. You know, just <laughs> totally oblivious. Yeah. And then the other day, <laughs> and then the other day, I um. I kind of just saw the spider and, you know, I don't like killing things for, you know, just because I don't like the thought of them being in the house. So I said to my friend, oh, do you mind just taking that spider outside? And he goes, no, I'm actually going to kill that one. <laughs> I was like, why? <laughs> Third most dangerous spider in Australia. <laughs> so these little things are teaching me as I go. <laughs> how, how widespread are the kangaroos? Oh yeah, they're they're in a lot of places. Yeah, they're cool. Right, they're I didn't cool. Think I thought they were like crazy. <laughs> they look like they're dangerous. They're all jacked up like they're on steroids. Yeah, they've got quite an aggressive streak actually. Um, and yeah, the koalas. I saw a koala in the wild a, a few months ago, which was pretty amazing. Because um, you know they, they're quite rare to see, sort of just out in wildlife. They tend to either be hiding in the trees or, you know, there's, there's not that many of them, yeah. especially after all the fires. Um, so two years ago now, there was a lot of damage to all of their habitat. So mm. the numbers completely came down, which is a shame. Yeah, they're, but so they're cute. Super cute, yeah. Are but I think they've, also, they've got a bit of an aggressive streak Do as they? well. I think so, yeah. <laughs> a strong bite. <laughs> <laughs> I had to send Brett to Australia. He, he'll go check it out for us. <laughs> Report back live, Brett. I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> Just don't don't pick up any uh, snakes with white bands around them. Hey, you, you buy the ticket. I'm on my way. <laughs> Have you guys ever been? No, I've been to Germany. And, yeah, and it was no, beautiful there. So I highly recommend Australia if you ever get the opportunity. Very cool. You know, aside from the sharks and the aggressive <laughs> koalas and the snakes, <laughs> no, they're not really around. It's it's a it's a great life. And actually, I found, you know, moving because environment was such a big deal for me with my addiction and the association of it. Um, it's for me an amazing environment to be in um for the health of my recovery. So it's a great place. I highly recommend it. Yeah. All right. Who wants to win a free trip to Australia? <laughs> this, this kid. <laughs> yeah. What's the hashtag, Jr. <laughs> hashtag. Go buy yourself a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's um there is obviously still an underworld of, you know drinking and addiction stuff that um i'm not privy to because i choose not to be in that world anymore but from a healthy lifestyle perspective you know you've got these big long beaches and great weather and you know brunch is a huge deal culturally over here so things are based around mornings and you know having a great morning and starting the day in that way and all that kind of stuff so it's really nourishing for i know now now you can enjoy it i mean in recovery 
Yeah. yeah. You're not hung over or chasing a high. Yeah, exactly. And it's actually just different heights now, you know, sort yeah. of these beautiful long stretches of beach and yeah. stand up paddle boarding and finding nice cafes. And again, it goes back to finding joy in other things. Uh, someone just commented commented that there are 1.9 million sober people in Australia. Wow. Let's get them listening to your page. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Very cool. Do we want to uh, do we want to give Jeff's uh, book away? We only have two entries still. We need to get a couple more I think people. He gave it away this. to somebody. I know he sent a copy to to the guy that was saying that he had uh, what was it forty six days sixty three sixty three. Look at me, I'm I'm dyslexic. I apologize. Sixty three days. Um, so are we still. I guess we can wait for Jeff to comment. Are we doing another? Are we still giving away another copy, or was that the copy that we were doing for the giveaway, Jeff? He said that's different, so I guess we're okay. still doing a, another giveaway. Sophie, you can enter too now. Oh, I didn't know that. Can't you enter? Of course you, you can. can. Enter, right? Anybody can enter. What do I do? <laughs> Use sober slogans for a chance to win. Do I just add my... Yeah, just, uh, right, just right there in the comments, just put hashtag sober slogans, all one word. in in our chat uh there should be two oh that was that's the private chat it should be oh. you should have an option for the for the chat with everybody in it it should be comments you got a comments yeah. up top comments oh, banners yeah. brand private chat or is that just on ours i don't she doesn't have the banners and brands and stuff but she should have comments in private chat i don't have an option to actually add a comment though i can see them all Huh, she didn't have an option for it. That's odd. Looking okay. at the uh, the comments, I just saw um, that person who with the husky, 10 weeks old. Oh, my goodness. It's the start of a big <laughs> adventure. Jeff <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah don't know what's in for him. Yeah, good luck, Jeff. get some chew toys. <laughs> my boy he doesn't look like he would now but um he actually sort of chewed through through a door once <laughs> um the bottom end of a door he started you know scraping it where the carpet and then gnawing at the door and then once he'd made a hole just started pushing and, and pulling so there's you know a little um uh chunk of door missing from the bottom of the front door <laughs> And um, another time, he uh, he ran away. He just he just went, you know. And I was running this restaurant in the middle of the countryside in England, and nothing for miles. And I didn't find him. You know, he he was just gone for like two two hours. And then I had a call. It was the middle of lunch service, and I answered the phone. This guy was like, "Hey, I've got your dog." I said, "Oh, <laughs> where are you?" And he gave the address, and it was like nine kilometers away um at a farm a pig farm and i could just hear him yelping in the background i was like what are you what are you doing to my dog you know what's going on he said no no, no don't worry i'm not doing anything to your dog he keeps <laughs> trying to get into the pigs and getting electrocuted and then yelping and then trying again <laughs> so that's where the yelp's coming from i'm not doing anything <laughs> He, he was determined, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very determined. <laughs> All right. Should we do Jeff's giveaway? Yeah, roll it then. All right. Here we go. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting better at at launching this. It just it makes me click like three things before it'll come up. So I I try to do uh I gotta I gotta talk a little bit buy myself some time sometimes you have the best conversations with yourself man oh man who is that handsome guy right there 
Chrissy Morris. Didn't she say <laughs> she's gonna send it to Sophie? That's what she said. That's that's my wife. Oh, wow. <laughs> <Isn't it? laughs> do you do international postage? Is that a thing? Is that allowed? Um, ebook. <laughs> this is an e-book. Yeah, it's a it's a digital oh, copy. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Chrissy. Awesome. And Thomas came in just a second too late for the giveaway. Oh, and my wife said, we have a copy already. We do. We have a physical copy. I have a signed copy. Oh, see, I didn't get it. I didn't get mine signed. I need to send mine back. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a, a, a good story how uh, Vegas to do a uh, recovery workshops and Jeff was and Sarah were getting married in Vegas later on that week. We had met like a week or two prior, and I had just mentioned that, yeah, I'll be in Vegas. And I go, oh, so will we. So we hooked up, went out to dinner. You know, I got to meet them. I mean, great, good people. Good book. Sober slogans. Read it. Awesome. Leave a review. <laughs> nice. Nice, nice. Yeah. I, I did leave a review, actually. Well, I'll be re leaving a review for sure after I've read it. Awesome. Well, does anybody in the comments have any more questions for Sophie? Oh, there's, uh, there's Jeff shouting out your book, JR. Thanks, my brother. Oh, yeah, free ebook uh, starting tomorrow. I'm running a uh, five day Amazon uh, Kindle promotion. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. How do we get, how, do, how can we get that? Do we go on to Amazon um, and ebook? It should be, it might be free at midnight tonight. I have to look. Very cool. cool. Will you post a link to that on the Facebook page, Jr.? Yeah, I'll share. I I think I posted it last night when uh when I set it up on Amazon. Nice. Yeah, I'll be posting that on, and on Instagram, maybe even tweet it too. I'm not a big Twitter guy though. I think people are generally either more of a Twitter or an Instagram, right? It tends to be yeah. the preference. I mean, I, I kind of sew it up on Facebook, so it's my it's my favorite. Oh yeah, of course, on Facebook. I was just thinking between the two, you know, Instagram is the more um, visual, and then the Twitter is the more sort of text, generally more a little bit more text heavy, isn't it? Between those two, yeah. Facebook's still the the bigger empire, I think, of all three. Yeah. Uh, some they need they need your email address. Oh, um, you know, uh, we can send it to. Yeah, I I have her email address. I can send it to okay. Jeff off off the air. Okay. Oh, the countdown will begin at midnight for my book. Okay. Ah. Please leave a review. All right, Jeff. I'm texting it to you. Do, do, do. So no, no, uh, no more questions for Sophie. I think a lot of people wanted to know about the sharks. I didn't even ask about the saltwater <laughs> crocs. That was next. <laughs> I'm quite well from the crocs, although yeah, they are, they do sort of um, they like the, the the murky, cooler waters, so. Um, you know, some of my friends in Queensland, if I go there, there are certain no-go zones for stand-up paddleboarding that I hadn't even thought about before. These, you know, beautiful, um, like, waterways that kind of come in from the, the mouth of the ocean. Um, I was like, oh, that looks amazing. And like, yeah, we, we might not go there because it's um, it's mating season or, you know, oh. it's birthing season or something. I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I used to watch a lot of the uh, Crocodile Hunter. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think his, um, his son has really gone in his footsteps now. I think he's yes. like a mini-me kind of version, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. I miss Steve. Mm. Awesome. Well, what what do you think, Jr? You want to uh, you want to wrap things up? I'm <clears throat> um, sure. I mean, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Yeah, it's uh, it's getting close to my bedtime. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that. Five o'clock and. AM comes early here. <laughs> Sophie's still got the rest of her day ahead of her. I know. I have. Yeah, it's pretty weird, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I am. Um, my brother, my younger brother lives in LA, and, um, you know, I've got, I've got a couple of uh, friends with kids in America, and it's really cute when I speak with them, and they're saying, oh, so, so what happens tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> super cute i just saw an email with the book i think say thank you for that jeff's quick on the keys all right guys well thank you for tuning in to another episode of recovery revolution live we have live videos every monday evening or I guess Tuesday afternoon, if you're joining us from Australia, uh, the audio version of tonight's broadcast will be available in about an hour or so after this is over. And, uh, like I mentioned at the top of the show, I do another podcast called recovery survey. I put out a new episode every Wednesday morning. So be sure to check out that when you're in your podcast app, subscribing to the recovery revolution live and Jeff Vickers, the author of Sober Slogans, is going to be doing his very own live show starting this Saturday evening. Um, I can't remember the exact time. I think it's 7 p.m. 7 p.m. So be sure to tune in to that. It'll be here on the Recovery Revolution Facebook page. Um, and remember, guys, it's progress, not perfection. See Boom. you guys next week. Thanks for having me.